Farnabazus was on his way to meet the man ruining his country. Alongside him, his scribes and his secretaries, his advisors, and a guard of men-at-arms. As he rode in silence toward the meeting place, he imagined what he would say to this man, this Greek. This Greek was infesting Farnabazus' own lands, his ancestral lands, raiding, ravaging, scheming, carting away goods and driving off flocks, turning Farnabazus' Greek subjects against their lord with ridiculous stories of novelty and rebellion. Farnabazus inherited the governorship of these lands, these excellent lands, from his father, who inherited them from his father and he from his father. That man, Farnabazus' great-grandfather, was one of the generals of King Xerxes himself, Xerxes the Great. Farnabazus' great-grandfather fought these Greeks long ago in his majesty's service. He crushed them at Thermopylae. He burned their temples at Athens. But now, nearly 100 years after Xerxes' glorious expedition to punish the Greeks for their arrogant sins, these Greeks were still causing the Persians headaches, causing Farnabazus headaches. How would it play out when he got to the meeting place? While the Persians were the most noble and just of all the races of man, Greeks could be reasonable too. You could treat them like civilized men. They understood the conventions of diplomacy, of friendship, and favors. Farnabazus could picture the coming scene. He would, of course, speak first, as he was the elder, but he would address these men in their own language. As governor, as satrap of Phrygia, this province of the Persian Empire, Farnabazus had to rely on the intelligence, the character, and the willing compliance of so many Greeks who lived in the rich cities along the coastline. They were among the region's best fighters. He had to be completely fluent in their language. And as he and his counterparts sat on their ceremonial diplomatic thrones, Farnabazus was going to open the conversation by pointing out all the favors he had done for this Greek and his city the fairness he had shown to them. Then he would complain about the injustice of these military operations in his own territory. Farnabazus dressed for the occasion, as a Persian noble does. He wore a proper ceremonial robe, a diplomatic robe, worth several dozen head of oxen. His chamberlain arranged for proper facial makeup on the eyes and the cheeks, as one does, to project the appropriate level of dignity and authority. And there were the incense and the perfumes, the sweet-smelling spices, as was only fitting. But as they drew near, he saw the other party. There they were, resting in the shade beneath a tall plane tree. A small group of soldierly-looking men, all dressed the same, reclining almost casually in the grass in workmanlike military attire. Ha! Huh. Very well, then. At first, Farnabazus wondered, where's their leader? The man he needs to talk to. But as he got closer, he saw. There was one man lying down among the group. He was smaller than the others, but as he spoke with them, you could tell by the vigor of his gestures and by the posture of the others, the way they all looked at him and subtly responded to his every expression. It was unmistakable. This was the man, the king of the Spartans. Farnabazus dismounted and started to approach. The Spartan king rose from the ground and dusted some grass off his tunic. Farnabazus's attendants began to run up with the gilded couches, the ceremonial cushions, the fans, the post and canvas and ropes for the satrapal tent. But Farnabazus waved them all off impatiently. Not today. He handed his cloak to a minister, strode up and looked the king in the eye. So then, they would do it Greek style. Farnabazus smiled politely. He extended his hand, the king extended his, and they shook. Then Farnabazus, the son of Pharnakes II, the satrap of all Phrygia, got down and reclined right there on the grass with the Spartans. He began by addressing his adversary by name in the vocative. Agesilae, that is... Agesilaus.
I'm Alex Petkus, and you're listening to The Cost of Glory, where it is our mission to retell the lives of the great Greek and Roman leaders in order to bring out greatness in ourselves. We follow the lead of Plutarch, the ancient author behind the Parallel Lives, a collection of the most influential biographies in human history. This is part one of three of the life of Agesilaus, king of Sparta. Plutarch lived about 2,000 years ago in the early Roman Empire, around the time of Seneca and Epictetus. He wrote his biographies in parallel. He'd pick one Roman from the past and a Greek from an earlier era, before the Romans took over control of Greece, and he'd write up their lives and compare them side by side. Agesilaus's Roman counterpart is Pompey the Great, the famous friend and then mortal enemy of Julius Caesar, both Agesilaus and Pompey were noted for their skill in commanding armies. Both were famous for pushing military campaigns further east than any of their countrymen ever had. Plutarch also titles Agesilaus as the Great, and perhaps he was the greatest of all Spartan kings. But like Pompey, Agesilaus also had a softer side. He was a devoted friend to a fault. One time he heard about a friend being accused of a crime, and he wrote to the judge, if Nicias is innocent, acquit him. If he is guilty, acquit him for my sake. But whatever you do, acquit him. Anyone who encountered Agesilaus walked away remembering his grim and sometimes odd sense of humor. One time he was performing a religious ritual, and he was bit by a louse mid-sacrifice. And he didn't flinch or stop the service, but he plucked the louse up and crushed it before the eyes of his associates, and he said, Ah, what delight to catch the plotter, even here at the altar. Criminals in those days often ran to altars for sanctuary to escape punishment for their crimes. And Agesilaus was quotable. He was like Lincoln or Churchill or Einstein, someone who people just attributed random quotes to because it was plausible. Reportedly, when someone asked him why Sparta had no walls, he pointed to a group of citizens in full armor and he said, These are Sparta's walls. But then again, that quote is also attributed to other figures. He was modest. Plutarch, some 400 years later, visited Sparta, and he saw Agesilaus's spear, which they still preserved with reverence even then. And it was no different from the spear of other men. Hey guys, before we go on, an urgent message here. If you're a fan of The Cost of Glory, you will love another podcast hosted by my friend and colleague, Ben Wilson. It's called How to Take Over the World. I think the name alone probably ought to convince you. How to Take Over the World is a similar concept to Cost of Glory, but it includes more modern figures. I love it. You'll love it. My favorite episode is probably Vladimir Putin, so go start with that one. You should subscribe too, and it's available right here in your favorite podcast player. Also, if you haven't heard, we at Ancient Life Coach are organizing a retreat in Rome. It's focused on the art of public speaking and public writing, which the Greeks and the Romans called rhetoric. We will see some of the places in the city where many of the greatest public speaking events in history happened. Some of them I've told about already in this podcast, others we'll get to later. And we'll also read about and discuss some of the great texts and ideas on the classic art of rhetoric, with an eye, as always, to improving ourselves for action. Spaces are filling up fast, but we have a few left. Find out more at ancientlifecoach.com slash retreat. Okay, back to the show. But for all his winning charm, Agesilaus was a force who stamped his era indelibly. The earlier Greek historian Thucydides said that in his own day, Athens while officially ruled by the people, was in fact subject to the rule of the leading man in the city. That was the statesman Pericles. And you could really make a similar statement about Sparta in the reign of Agesilaus. He threatened the very king of Persia. Back home in Greece, entire cities were founded to stop him. Is it a mere coincidence that within only a year or two after Agesilaus's death, Philip II of Macedon began his conquest of mainland Greece? That within a year or two of Agesilaus' death, the man who would conquer Persia, Alexander the Great, was born, a son to that same Philip II of Macedon, and into the political world that Agesilaus made. 
And like with Pompey, there are those who find faults with Agesilaus's legacy. Some have even made the case that Agesilaus was the most disastrous king in the history of Sparta. But our job, as always, following Plutarch, is to try as much as we can to discern the true character of the man. And understanding this begins with the fact that Agesilaus almost never became king. In fact, he almost didn't even make it into manhood. The Spartans, or Lacedaemonians as they usually call themselves, they lived in a large mountainous peninsula in southern Greece called the Peloponnese. Their homeland, which they called Lacedaemon or Laconia, was in the south of that peninsula. The Peloponnese is a little bit smaller than the U.S. state of Massachusetts. It's about two-thirds the size of Belgium. And like all of Greece, it was filled with other fiercely independent warlike city-states of various sizes. And from their small, unwalled city in the southeast of this peninsula, the Spartans directly controlled about 40% of the fertile lands of the peninsula. They subjected many local populations to the status of helots or captives. Basically, they were serfs. And at the time of Agesilaus' birth, the Spartans controlled most of the rest of the peninsula too because of their leadership of a large coalition of allies on the Peloponnesian Peninsula. These allies were collectively called the Peloponnesian League, which Sparta dominated. Now, that kind of domination comes at a price. The Spartans had to be superior strategically, politically, militarily, of course, but they also had to be physically tougher than the people they ruled and led. And so they culled the weak. There was a canyon on the slopes of lofty Mount Taigatos that they called Apothetai, the place of abandonment. And if any infant of the Lacedaemonian warrior class exhibited any congenital weakness or deformity, they would expose the child at that place and let the gods do as they willed, or slave traders, or wolves. It's remarkable, but Agesilaus was just such a deformed child. He was born with a lame leg that gave him an unmistakable limp for all his life. He learned to be cheerful about it. You could often find him making jokes about it at his own expense. But this deformity had to have been apparent from a very young age. Agesilaus was born into one of the two hereditary royal households of Sparta. They had a unique dual kingship system that we'll talk about in a little bit. And you might think that a child born into one of these households would be exempted from this harsh eugenic policy. But in fact, the Spartans were, if anything, even more obsessed with the physical health and strength of their kings. And yet, for some reason, Agesilaus was spared. We don't know why. Maybe he didn't even know why himself. And I think this might have had a lot to do with his extraordinary energy and ambition as though all his life he was trying to prove that the gods, that Sparta, had not made a mistake in sparing him. What Agesilaus was not spared, though, was the legendary, harsh Spartan youth training program, the famous Agoge. The name of the system literally means the leading from the word ago. The Agoge made the Spartan warriors, despite their intense ambition and pride and battle prowess, nonetheless capable of being led and of fighting in the awe-inspiring Spartan phalanx, the most feared military unit in the world. The Agoge rendered Spartans more useful to the greater goals of Sparta, in Plutarch's words, like horses that are broken in while they are still colts. Interestingly, though, the young heirs to the royal throne of Lacedaemon were typically exempted from the Agoge. They were given a different training, a training in how to command. The kings were, after all, the ones who led the army in the field. But even though his father was King Archidamus, nobody expected young Agesilaus to become king. His much older half-brother, Agis, was the heir to the throne. Agis would have sons, and one of them would go on to become king. And so, from age 7 to 18, Agesilaus was put through the Agoge like the rest of the Spartan boys. And maybe as he was enduring a savage beating from one of the older boys one day, 
that was the standard penalty for any minor infraction committed by the cadets, or maybe one night as he was sneaking into a farmer's storehouse to steal food, because during periods of the Agoge, the cadets were given no food and expected to steal to sustain themselves, and the penalty for being caught stealing, of course, was another savage beating, or maybe drifting off to sleep under the stars one night, wrapped up in the single tattered cloak that Spartan boys had to make last an entire year of training. Maybe Agesilaus thought about the last king of Sparta who had personally been through the Agoge. That man, several generations earlier, well, he had not been expected to rule either. It was King Leonidas, the man who led the 300 Spartans to die defending the pass at Thermopylae from the invasion of the Persian King Xerxes. Was it possible that going through the leading was one of the keys to Leonidas' greatness, his ability to inspire his men to stand and fight with him down to the very last man? Might Sparta someday, somehow, call Agesilaus to some equally noble purpose? It was in that war, the Great Persian War, that Sparta won her reputation as a defender of Greek freedom. But that war ended in 478 BC, nearly four decades before Agesilaus' birth. The conflict that marked Agesilaus' coming of age was instead the greater, longer, bloodier war that Sparta fought against Athens. A war, unfortunately, between fellow Greeks. It broke out in 431 BC, when Agesilaus was around 13 years old. His father, King Archidamus, opposed the war, but the king dutifully led the Peloponnesian League's army into Athenian territory when his city ordered him to. Despite their title, Spartan kings don't actually make the decisions about going to war. And unlike the commanders in other cities, they don't have the luxury of being able to resign in a huff. And we call that great inter-Greek struggle the Peloponnesian War today, because we know about it mostly from ancient Athenian witnesses to the war, writers like Thucydides and Xenophon. And that's what the Athenians called the war, the Peloponnesian War, after their enemies, the Peloponnesian League. When Agesilaus got old enough, he fought alongside his countrymen in the Athenian War, as the Spartans called it. He was probably there in 418 BC at the Great Battle of Mantinea, one of the largest in generations. At Mantinea, his brother, the new king, Agus, led Sparta and her allies to a victory over Athens. The Peloponnesian War pulled the entire Greek world into conflict, from the powerful cities of Sicily and southern Italy in the far west, all the way east to the Greeks on the coast of Asia Minor. Cities and islands were forced to pick sides. Athens or Sparta. Anyone that tried to stay neutral got dominated or captured, like the unlucky island of Milos. In that kind of situation, how could Agesilaus, or anyone for that matter, hope to resurrect the old Spartan ideal of Greek unity against barbarian domination, the legacy of Leonidas and Thermopylae? That kind of stuff must have sounded like playground fantasy by 431. How could Agesilaus, as a grown man at least, ever really imagine that he himself, an unusually short, limping, minor relation of one of the two kings of Sparta, was the man destined to try it? Well, to answer that, you have to go and understand a little bit of how the war ended and about the man who ended it. He was Agesilaus' friend. His name was Lysander. And... We've told Lysander's side of the story already elsewhere in his biography, so check that out sometime. But let's review a bit of the context here. In 404 BC, after 27 years of conflict, the Spartan coalition finally, decisively, defeats the Athenians and ends the war. And they do it with a shock upset victory. They annihilate the Athenian naval fleet in a surprise attack. It's called the Battle of Aegospotomy. And Lysander is the Spartan who pulls it off. Without their warships, the Athenians are helpless. They've been under siege by land for about 10 years, and they can't contend with the Spartans on the land. And without a navy, they have no way to supply their city from the sea. So after they lose around 200 ships in a single afternoon, almost their entire fleet, they capitulate pretty fast. 
and things get interesting for Agesilaus here. This victory made his friend Lysander the most powerful man in Greece. Not the kings of Sparta, not Agus or Pausanias, no, Lysander. Lysander won this victory at the Battle of Aegospotomy, operating as the Lacedaemonian admiral. As I said, the Spartans have a unique system of two hereditary kings, and the kings have various limited powers at home in peace. But in war, the kings serve their primary function, and that is to take turns leading the Spartan land armies. But the kings, like most of the rest of the Spartans, are really land specialists. And so the Spartans appoint other leading men to take turns commanding their fleet as admiral or navarch. The kings don't command the fleet of ships. And usually the Spartan navy just plays a minor role, a supporting role, supply ops. It's usually relatively small. And so the admiral was not really that powerful usually. But to defeat Athens, the Spartans had to adapt and to build a massive fleet. And in that situation, the right man who played his cards right could leverage the position of Navarch into tremendous influence. And Lysander does just that. I mean, think about it. There's so many supply contracts to negotiate. There's so many field decisions about which allies to promote, which enemies to spare, who should lead where and how. And there's so much money to raise too. And we'll get to that in a moment. But now with the war over, there's no hiding the fact that it's Lysander and not the kings of Sparta who really won the war, which is tricky. Well, after the great victory, Lysander sails around the Aegean Sea, which is the sea that separates Greece from Asia Minor, modern Turkey, or just Asia as the Greeks call it, and we'll call it that too. The Aegean region is filled with Greek city-states, both the many islands and sometimes several city-states on an island, and also along the Asian coast there are a lot of cities. And most of these cities in the past were either allied with Athens or at least sympathetic to it. But Lysander puts men in charge of these places who are going to keep their cities loyal to Sparta now. These are men who are willing to do whatever it took, which sometimes, yes, required brutal force. And this frightens many people, this policy of installing loyalist juntas. And many people who were frightened are the Spartans themselves, maybe even Agesilaus. But then Lysander is Agesilaus's friend. Now, friend is an understatement. The Greeks, more than any other culture I've encountered, believed in the awesome and sometimes destructive power of male friendship. The Spartans had a special name for it when two young men going through that hellish training in the Agoge would pair off and become best friends. They would encourage these friendships, especially between a somewhat older boy and a younger boy, and they would monitor them closely, and they would call the older boy the lover, the erastes, and the younger boy the beloved, the eromenos. And this translation here is a little bit misleading to us because it wasn't supposed to be sexual, so it might be better to say admirer and admired, but it was supposed to be an intense friendship where you're willing to die for each other, and where you'll do anything not to lose respect in your friend's esteem. The Spartans thought this was healthy, and they thought it deserved a special name. Well, Lysander was Agesilaus' admirer. They met in the Agoge, Lysander a little bit older. And here's what Plutarch says. Lysander, quote, was smitten particularly with Agesilaus's native decorum. For although Agesilaus was contentious and high-spirited beyond his fellows, wishing to be the first in all things and having a vehemence and a fury which none could contend with or overwhelm, on the other hand, he had such a readiness to obey and such gentleness that he did whatever was enjoined upon him, not at all from a sense of fear, but always from a sense of honor. And he was more distressed by censure than he was oppressed by hardships, end quote. In other words, Agesilaus feared losing respect more than anything else. He and Lysander were maybe the two most talented and ambitious men alive in Sparta at the time. 
Agesilaus and Lysander might have gone down as one of the great friendships in history, like Epaminondas and Pelopidas of Thebes, or David and Jonathan of Israel. They might have, if the circumstances had been different. But let's not skip ahead. Now, after Lysander won the war in 404 BC, Agesilaus, now a man of about 40, well, given his prominence at Sparta as the half-brother of King Agus, he can't help but hear the sort of things that some Spartan nobles are saying. Lysander will corrupt our way of life with all that foreign gold he's bringing in. Our new allied cities are run by friends of Lysander, not friends of Sparta. This man is out of control. And this is hard on Agesilaus, who was loyal to a fault. In Plutarch's words, Agesilaus was less blameworthy as an enemy than as a friend, for he would not injure his enemies without just cause, but joined his friends even in their injustice. So he was loyal, but there was no denying it. Lysander divided Sparta in two. On the one hand, there are those Spartans who want Sparta, now that they've won the war, to retreat back to the shade of Mount Taigetos. Now that they've taught the Athenians a lesson on the dangers of hubris and imperialism, Athenian expansionism is what brought about the Great War in the first place. Sparta should now restrain herself and reassume her position of local leadership in the Peloponnese, take up her ancestral role as first among equals of the great powers of Greece. To Spartans of this perspective, the best situation was a gentlemanly balance of power in Greece, but one in which the Spartans, of course, hopefully, usually controlled the fulcrum. Let's call these the Spartan Respectability Party. And then there are the Spartans of Lysander's perspective. You might call them the Spartan Greatness Party. Sparta has proven that she is the best among the cities, the most capable, disciplined, the strongest. It is a new era. Didn't this great conflict show exactly where the whole balance of power approach leads to? Endless war. In the new era, Sparta should assume her responsibility of leading all the Greeks. And there was no question which party had the most talent and initiative on its side, and this one was it. This was the party of the bright future, and it was Agesilaus's party too. It was a shame to see Sparta riven by faction. And where Lysander was a divider, Agesilaus was a consensus builder by disposition. But progress requires struggle. And anyway, one of the most divisive steps toward the future that Lysander ever took was to make his friend Agesilaus king of Sparta. Sparta, again, has two kings. They have a lot of moral authority back at home and some official authority, like tie-breaking votes and councils, first rights speaking. But there are many checks and balances on them in domestic politics. And the biggest of all is, well, there are two of them, which tends to make them competitors, focal points of rival party politics, which the Spartans thought was what their ancient lawgiver Lycurgus intended. But whatever their actual power... The kings are unquestionably the two most important figureheads in Sparta. And so it was a shock to everyone when King Agus's wife got pregnant by another man. Remember, this is Agesilaus' older brother we're talking about here. And what's more, everyone knew the story. What happened? Well, an extremely handsome and charming renegade Athenian politician and general, Alcibiades was his name, he took refuge in Sparta in the middle of the Great War, got chased out of Athens, was in exile. And while Agus was away on campaign, Alcibiades seduced the queen. The Spartans chased him out of town a little bit after that, but the damage was done. King Agus and the queen, unfortunately, were unable to produce any other male heirs. And maybe that's why the king allowed his wife to raise the boy. But still, King Agus refuses to acknowledge the kid as his own. Until he's on his deathbed in 399. So we're four years after the end of the war. And, well, maybe in a moment of weakness or maybe a moment of compassion, depending on how you read it, 
King Agus finally relents, and he gives in to the pleading, or the manipulation, as some thought, of many friends and relatives, not least the boy himself, who's a young teenager. And, well, Agus adopts the kid as his heir. The boy's name is Leotikidas. And then Agus dies. The king is dead. Long live the king. King Leotikidas, right? Well, here's where Lysander steps in and changes history. Lysander insists that everyone knows Leotikidas is illegitimate, whatever the dying King Agus might have blurted out in his final delirious fever. Isn't it obvious that the Spartan throne should not go to this teenage Alcibiades Jr., this Athenian, but rather to the deceased king's half-brother, Agesilaus, who again is in his 40s, battle-tested, well-liked by all. The idea of Lysander, though, having his man on one of the two thrones is intolerable for the Spartan respectability types. And they push hard for Laotikidas. It would be perfect, right? This young kid, they'd be able to control him. Well, these guys find a diviner, a religious specialist, who searches the old books of oracles and prophecies, and in his research, he unearths a certain ancient prophecy that went like this. Beware, O Lady Sparta, although you greatly boast, lest you, though sound of foot, bear forth a kingship lame. For if you do, then sicknesses unexpected you will reap, and on you crash the rolling wave of life-destroying war. So, a kingship lame, or you could translate it, a limping kingship. The Spartans were a very religious people, mind you, and, you know, this ancient prophecy seems to single out Agesilaus specifically. Everyone knows he walks with a limp. And the prophecy is foretelling long wars and sicknesses unexpected if they elevate him. Pretty scary. But Lysander fires back. Well... Wouldn't the lamest kingship of all be the one in which Sparta was ruled by the spawn of their sworn enemies? And the council of the Lacedaemonian elders takes a vote. And they award the kingship of the Europonted house to Agesilaus. So Lysander gets his way. But there's still a lot of tension. And this is a difficult period for Agesilaus entering upon office. First, he expels Laotikides from Sparta. Poor kid, you know, but what choice does he really have? And he takes full possession of the royal estates. But he makes a smart move here. Agesilaus doesn't want to be a divider, but a uniter of Sparta, remember? So he takes half of all the royal properties, wide, rich farmlands, the foundation of family wealth, and he distributes them among the poorer Spartan citizens. And then he immediately starts a policy that ends up really being a centerpiece of his reign. At Sparta, there's a supreme council of elders, the Gerousia, 30 men elected for life. They make many of the important decisions for the city. And then there are five annually elected ephors, which means overseers. And that's an office designed to oversee, well, everything, but especially the kings and to be a check on them. And like most Greeks, the Spartans are pretty paranoid about any one citizen getting too much power. So traditionally, these ephors are rivals and adversaries of the kings. They're overseeing them and you know, looking for them to screw up. But Agesilaus makes a point of winning the ephors over instead. And whenever they visit him, whether he's at home or in council, he gets up from his seat and he rises so as to honor them. And this is really unheard of. It's very flattering for these often pretty humbly born men. And on top of that, whenever a man is elected to the council of 30 elders, the Gerousia, Agesilaus sends him an ox and a cloak to honor him for the occasion. And as a result, he makes these men who are inferior in rank to him, but still men of influence in the state, he makes them his friends and his loyal supporters. And so, as Plutarch notes, while he was thought to be honoring and exalting the dignity of their office, he was subtly increasing his own influence. And their goodwill towards him makes them more compliant. Think of that when you're dealing with a conflict in an organization, especially from people that you think, well, they have no right. Well, what would Agesilaus do? 
But Agitaleus doesn't have very long to get comfortable in his new role before Lysander calls on his services. It was time to revive an old idea, one that they had talked about as young men. A solution to both the Persian problem and the Greek problem as well. The Greek problem was simple. The Greek cities were constantly warring with each other and keeping each other in check, never rising to greater things. And this was related, though, to the Persian problem. For more than a hundred years now, the Greeks have been living in the shadow of the Persians. Ever since Xerxes' great Greek invasion failed, the Persian kings, with their massive resources and massive empire, stretching from Turkey to Kuwait, from Egypt to Afghanistan, the greatest land empire the world had yet seen, well, they've been interfering in Greek affairs, playing them against one another wherever possible. The Athenians built their great, now fallen empire by claiming leadership of a Greek anti-Persian defense league. They proved that you could unite Greeks more or less willingly around this common endeavor of ending Persian influence in the region. Athens's fatal flaw was the arrogance and unrestraint of its average citizens. It was a democracy. In other words, ruled by a mob. The mob was greedy. The mob was all for abusing their unlucky inferior subordinate cities in the league. And this was what provoked the war, which cost them their empire. Sparta, though, was ruled by a few of its best men, the best of the best. Its decisions were made by natural-born leaders, war-hardened, the Gerousia, the Ephors, the kings. And Sparta now had the beginnings of their own empire. And moreover, Athens could harass Persia, but they could never hope to conquer it because Persia was a land power and Athens was a naval power. All of their efforts over the years of Athens' anti-barbarian league, the Delian League, it all added up to little more than organized piracy. But a land power like Sparta, well, and now was finally the time because Persia was weak, weaker than ever. Now, one has to admit, Lysander did use the Persians to defeat the Athenians. He persuaded the Persians to pay to build a Spartan navy, a huge outlay of gold to build hundreds of ships. And Lysander's main contact, though, among the Persians was a prince named Cyrus. And Cyrus was the best Persian by far. He was a dear friend to Lysander, to many Greeks, a good man. It was hard to even call such a sophisticated lover of Greek culture a barbarian. But now Cyrus was dead. He staged a coup. He tried to overthrow his sluggish, weak, and envious older brother, the Persian king Artaxerxes. 10,000 Greek mercenaries followed Cyrus all the way to Babylon. They won the battle against the king, Yes, there were many more barbarians in that army, but everyone believed that it was the Greeks that were most of all responsible for the victory. They proved, once again, the superiority of heavy Greek infantry tactics against Persian troops, just like they had long ago at Thermopylae. Heavy Greek infantry tactics, of which Sparta was the master among masters. Unfortunately for the coup, Prince Cyrus was killed in that victorious battle. But that left Artaxerxes, the weakling, still on the throne. And the 10,000 Greek mercenaries fought their way back to Greece all through hostile territory. Most of them, anyway, made it. They were ravaging the backyard of the great king of Persia, practically unopposed. And the story is told in Xenophon's Anabasis. And you can, by the way, check that out in our recent series for more on that book. Think of the military intelligence that the Greeks now have at their disposal from all these men, and even more importantly, the open secret, no longer a secret at all, really, that all the Greek cities are now talking about. Persia is ripe for the taking. Their leadership is asleep at the tiller. Lysander's plan is bold. It's time to unite the Greeks. Sparta is the city to unite them. Agesilaus, you are the man to unite them. And so, how could Agesilaus refuse? Well, Lysander gets into motion. 
He taps all of his contacts, leaders of all the Greek cities on the coast of Asia Minor, people that he's installed, and letters start pouring in to the Supreme Council of 30 at Sparta from across the Greek East. And these letters all tell the same story, some story about the king of Persia organizing a retaliation against the Greeks for participating in the usurper's army. They stand in need of a defender. They beseech holy Lacedaemon, blah, blah, blah. Whatever. It wasn't entirely false. But every single letter demanded that the Spartans send Agesilaus to lead them in a defense against the aggressions of Persia. And so the Spartans somewhat reluctantly dispatch Agesilaus with a small band of advisors, including, of course, Lysander, as well as a modest force of troops, not their best troops, mostly freed helots, but fine, some troops. And Agesilaus meets up with a force of 5,000 of Sparta's Peloponnesian League allies, drawn from dozens of different cities, and they begin mustering their transport ships for departure. Before Agesilaus embarked, he wanted to start off their expedition on the right foot. But something disturbing happened. On his way to the rallying point, Agesilaus stops at a place called Aulis on the shores of Boeotia. And Aulis is the spot where the legendary king Agamemnon mustered the Greek ships to set off for Troy on that first great mythic eastern expedition that Homer once sang about in the Iliad, the Trojan War. And as Agesilaus arrives with his men at the holy temple of Artemis at Aulis, He lays down and has a dream. And here's Plutarch. As he slept, Agesilaus thought he heard a voice come to him, saying, King of the Lacedaemonians, you are surely aware that no one has ever been appointed general of all Greece together except Agamemnon in former times, and now you after him. And since you command the same men as he did and wage war on the same foes and set out for the war from the same place, it is fitting that you should sacrifice also to the goddess the same sacrifice which he made there before he set sail. End quote. And you may have heard of this myth. Well, the story goes, before the legendary Trojan expedition began, The goddess Artemis was upset for some reason, and she was blowing storm winds in the wrong direction, which was making it impossible to sail. And she demanded, to satisfy her rage, that King Agamemnon sacrifice his own daughter, Iphigenia. So, the same sacrifice, eh? Well, after this dream, Agesilaus consults with his soothsayer, and they agree that Artemis, goddess of the hunt, would be more pleased this time by a deer. And so they get the victim ready and they bring it up to the altar at the temple of Artemis there at Aulis. And it's a glorious day. It's a glorious gesture too. A day of hope and anticipation. But as they're right there in the middle of the proceedings, with the legs of the victim freshly roasted on the altar there, a small band of horsemen appears in the distance coming fast. As they get closer, it becomes clear. It's the Thebans. Ah, Thebes. The one allied city that refused to send any troops for this Asian invasion. Allied city is a little bit too cheery of a word for what the Thebans were now. And they're not at war, but relations aren't exactly great between Thebes and Sparta. Thebes was an ally crucial to the Spartans' victory over Athens. So they felt, at least. But the Spartans had, well, not been so generous in dividing the spoils of war. The Thebans thought that they were just getting the crumbs from Sparta's table like they always did. I mean, really, though, hadn't it been Lysander and the Spartan navy that defeated Athens? The Thebans were a land power, a notable one, but that's still all they were. They had failed to adapt, hadn't they? Well... Thebes had demanded, after the war, that Sparta annihilate Athens. Thebes is actually a lot closer to Athens. It's on the other side of Athens from Sparta. And Lysander was actually the main voice against this. He wanted Athens 
mainly to stand as a bulwark against the rising threat of Thebes, which he foresaw. The Thebans were still sore about that and other things, and recently they went past their usual empty threats and complaints and boasts because after the war, Lysander installed a pro-Sparta regime at Athens to help keep the peace, and we might call it a dictatorship or a junta, the 30 they were called, but some prominent Thebans had the gall to help a group of Athenian exiles overthrow the pro-Sparta regime. And these men were never punished by the Theban authorities. So the whole city was complicit, really, even though they were nominally still allies of Sparta. And that was 403 BC, only seven years ago, and it was one of many sore spots between Sparta and Thebes, and relations had deteriorated even more by this point, around 396. And, well, all this, where Agesilaus happens to be standing right now and sacrificing, it's in Boeotia. The Thebans are the lords of Boeotia. It's their region. It's their turf. They claim authority over this holy temple and all the activities performed therein by ancestral right. Well, yes, Agesilaus knew that, of course. And maybe it was no accident that he was sacrificing right here, right now, on the very turf of the one city that insulted him by snubbing his expedition. Well, the Thebans were furious at this encroachment. Then the riders come and they dismount and they storm up the steps. Words are exchanged, tempers heat up, and suddenly, before the Spartans can react, some of the Thebans run up and they fling the holy offerings from the altar right off into the dirt. Agesilaus is enraged. He calls curses down upon the Thebans, calling on Artemis, the huntress, to be witness of this outrageous impiety, this insult against her holy name. But then the Thebans ride off. Their work was done. And there was nothing more for Agesilaus to do here. The troops were assembled at a port nearby, and time was slipping away. He goes to meet his soldiers, and they all embark for Asia. And he tries to remain cheerful in front of his men. But in his mind, there's an air of ill-boding cast over the entire expedition, as though something in him already knows how it's going to end. But nothing to help you put your dark thoughts away like a sea voyage. Agesilaus lands at the great city of Ephesus, and he gets to work. Shortly after landing, he gets a message from Tissaphernes. That's the local Persian governor, the satrap of Lydia. And Tissaphernes asks him, what does Agesilaus desire by landing in Asia? And Agesilaus replies, that the Greek cities in Asia shall be independent, as are those in our part of Greece. These are rich Greek cities of Asia that he's talking about. Cities of Aeolus, cities of Ionia, like Ephesus, Colophon, Clazomenae, Miletus, Smyrna, Prieni. They're perched at the mouths of deep soil valleys with rich mines, excellent ports, the jewels around the neck of Asia. Tissaphernes responds, that's reasonable. How about we swear an oath to keep a truce? And then I'll go and negotiate with the great king on your behalf. Hmm, this seems a little too easy. But Agesilaus accepts, and they swear oaths. But instead of presenting the Spartan demand to the king of Persia, Tissaphernes requests the great king send him a great army, which he immediately mobilizes to march on Ephesus. Agesilaus responds by spreading news around that the Persians are lying oath-breakers, contemptuous of the gods. It's his first propaganda victory, and so the game is afoot. Before he can really pursue the war fully, Agesilaus is faced with a difficult choice. And this went on to be one that many blamed him for. You see, when the Spartan mission arrives at Ephesus, every city dignitary, every foreign diplomat, mercenary captain, or merchant contractor turns his eyes and his flattery not to Agesilaus and the other Spartan leaders, but to Lysander. This was understandable. Lysander did, after all, spend the past decade and a half in this theater of war, building friendships, contacts, constitutions, empire. It is even said that Lysander was the first Greek to be given honors equal to a god when the nearby island of Samos changed its national festival for a year or two to be in honor not of Hera, 
but of Lysander. And now apparently there's this modest, self-deprecating, humbly dressed, hobbling kinglet, as some called him, a man of short stature so that he literally stands in Lysander's shadow, a man who barely even enjoys name recognition outside of a few people very in the know about Sparta's who's who. And yes, he has the title of king and all, but was everyone else really supposed to believe that this was the man that was going to lead the Greeks in their holy war, Agesilaus? For 15 years, Lysander has been the man that you need to talk to, to get a favor granted, to get things done. And everyone assumes that that was the way that things would continue to be. And Lysander seems to assume this as well. The only ones who do not share that assumption is the small number of actual Spartans participating in and leading the campaign. These men are fuming, and they let Agesilaus know it. Lysander is doing nothing to disabuse his flatterers of these illusions. He's making a mockery of Sparta and her institutions. The king is the commander-in-chief, not just some silly figurehead. Lysander would be nothing without Sparta. And Plutarch here, and some other ancient authorities too, attribute Agesilaus' actions to an excess of contentiousness, of envy even. According to Plutarch, he began to fear that any brilliant success which he might achieve in his undertakings would be attributed to Lysander, owing to that man's glorious reputation. But maybe it was more that even then, Agesilaus had already formulated his vision for Sparta. He and Lysander agreed on the necessity of projecting Spartan greatness a hundred years, a thousand years into the future. But Lysander was a divider. He was a party politics man. Agesilaus's goal for Sparta was something greater. His philosophy when it came to his own fellow citizens was to use persuasion to unite. As Plutarch elsewhere says, whenever he had a personal quarrel with a Spartan, Agesilaus would find a way to come to their aid and exert himself in their behalf, and so would make them friends instead of enemies and bring them over to his side so that no one was left to oppose him, end quote. He was a reconciler, and in this he was not unlike Pompey. Lysander, though, with his divine honors, with his exotic Persian friends, with his let's admit it, unmasked contempt for the freedom of Sparta's Greek inferiors, he was a most unspartan Spartan. And as he was now, at least, it was hard to see how he fit into this new Sparta that its new king was envisioning. And so Agesilaus, for the good of Sparta, he could hope, did a thing most contrary of all to his character. And he turned on a friend... Lysander would express his opinion on decisions in the king's council for all to hear. Agesilaus would make the opposite decision for all to see. Lysander's friends and associates and clients would show up at Agesilaus' quarters with favors to ask. They would be denied. Their rivals, even unworthy men, would show up and beg the king for something, and he would grant it with ease. And Lysander is a smart man, and he catches on quickly. He stops offering advice, stops recommending friends. But some of the other Greeks and out-of-towners are a little more slow-witted and dull when it comes to picking up subtleties. So Agesilaus removes all subtlety. Lysander needs an official position, a title, to clarify his true role. Agesilaus makes him his royal carver of meats. Did it pain Agesilaus? to abase his childhood friend like this? To deliberately dishonor the man who had shown him the ways of Spartan politics, of Greek politics? The man who had made him king, who arranged this whole expedition for him, the biggest opportunity of his life? What did he feel like when Lysander, at the end of his wits, came to him and said, My king, grant me one favor, as much for the sake of those who look to us for guidance as for my own? Please, Station me somewhere else. Somewhere I will be less obnoxious to you. Wherever I go, I will endeavor to aid your purposes. Well, it must have been painful to hear that. And yet, didn't it simply have to be done? How could a Sparta-led coalition thrive under the cloud of a man who split Sparta down the middle? 
Lysander was already greater than a Spartan king. How could Sparta come together? How could it even survive if Lysander made yet another even greater notch in his war belt, a Persian victory? Agesilaus wasn't the only one to realize it. Lysander had to be lowered. Well, Agesilaus let Lysander go. He gave him some modest errand to handle in Thrace. And as he watched his friend's ship sail off north, maybe he was already thinking of ways he could bring Lysander back into the fold to reconcile him as he was so good at doing. He had to rearrange the pecking order, yes, but it could be one that would include Lysander in a prominent position after things cooled down. Sparta needed Lysander's talents. Agesilaus needed him. But as it happened, that was the last time he ever saw his friend. But there, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Once Lysander leaves, Agesilaus' campaign in Asia gets off to a good start. Agesilaus' plan is essentially to detach the Persian subject peoples one by one. The Persian Empire is a massive and decentralized polity. Even their local governors, their satraps, have a lot of autonomy, and they occasionally even fight each other. And the king doesn't really care, as long as the tribute keeps flowing in. And the plan is, rally the Greeks first. They generally live on the coast. You get them to permanently throw off their Persian overlords to liberate themselves from the burden of paying tribute. And then they can convince other of the subject peoples deeper in the hinterlands to follow and spread chaos in general for the Persian king. Egypt, in fact, has been an open revolt for more than a decade. And so that's an example that they can point to that other peoples can follow. And it's a good plan. And even if it works only partially, well, they could still free the Greeks of Asia from tribute. I mean, if they don't conquer the Persian king at all. And they'd free those Greeks in the name of Sparta, in the name of Agesilaus. But it really is looking like it's going very well at first. One of the many notable things that Agesilaus does in Asia and there's no time to tell all of them, is he tricked Tissaphernes. And this was an achievement. If you're familiar with Xenophon's Anabasis, you'll remember Tissaphernes, satrap of Lydia, as a pretty devious man. Among his many tricks and deceptions, Xenophon says Tissaphernes was the one responsible for originally alienating the two royal brothers from each other. He slandered Cyrus before King Artaxerxes, and that eventually led to Artaxerxes retaliating, and that provoked Cyrus's coup attempt. Tissaphernes also tricked the generals of the 10,000 Greeks in the aftermath of the great battle of Kunaxa, where Cyrus died, and he pretended to be their friend, and then he lured them into coming to dinner with him under the banner of peace, then he murdered them. Well, Agesilaus manages to trick Tissaphernes to leave the great rich city of Sardis unguarded, he sends out some uh, mixed intelligence signals. It's pretty tricky. So the Greeks plunder Sardis and its territory. And Tissaphernes' Persian enemies take this opportunity here. They write to the king of Persia. And they say that Tissaphernes betrayed Sardis to the Spartans. And Artaxerxes sends a new man to replace Tissaphernes in the Persian style. The new governor surprises Tissaphernes in his bath, captures him, and beheads him. And Xenophon was there when Tissaphernes betrayed the Greek captains of the 10,000. And he was there when Agesilaus outwitted Tissaphernes. And Xenophon, well, he was a pious man. And I think that he considered Agesilaus as a sort of instrument of the gods, visiting divine retribution on this wicked oath breaker. And Xenophon wrote that in the art of deceiving enemies in war, Agesilaus showed Tissaphernes to be a mere child and by the way, in Agesilaus' reasoning, Tissaphernes did do a wicked thing by deceiving him earlier when they swore that oath before the gods to uphold a truce, and Tissaphernes had a habit of tricking people with oaths. But then, once war is declared, Agesilaus thought that deception was a general's right and even his duty. Agesilaus was very skilled in the art of morale building. When the men aren't busy marching and campaigning, he sets prizes for athletic contests and he organizes them between different units of the same kind, skirmishers, hoplites, archers, and cavalry. And he gets them all competing with each other in contests and literally gets them going to the gym, the gymnasion, which is that quintessentially Greek educational institution. And at one point he's at Ephesus and he decides to give the troops 
a little encouragement. He has some of the prisoners of war that have been captured from the Persians stripped down and paraded in front of the troops. And they're pasty white and weak looking. And Agesilaus calls out in front of the men, do you see now who we're fighting against? And the Greeks cheer. This only confirms the Greeks' belief that compared to the Persians, they themselves are the superior warriors. They're the ones who make the habit of training long hours in the hot sun in their gymnasiums to prepare for the life of war that they see as the shortest route to the best prizes anyone could hope for. And the new governor of Lydia, Tissaphernes' replacement, he soon offers Agesilaus a lot of money, 30 talents of silver, to go raid Phrygia to the north. In other words, just go to another Persian satrap's lands and bother him instead. Which is pretty funny, but there's Persian government for you. And Agesilaus accepts. What a deal, right? To let the Persians finance his Persian war effort. And so he heads to the territory of Pharnabazus. And as he goes along, he settles in at Phrygia, he's capturing cities, he's conducting raids, he's getting to know the territory, sharpening his skills as a general. But he's also making an impression on the peoples of Asia. And Plutarch talks about his simplicity of life, how he slept on a bed as humble as anyone's in the army, how he was indifferent to the weather, cheerful in the heat, the cold, the rain, the sun. He made a stark contrast to the Persian viceroys and generals who were cruel and pompous and reveled in wealth and luxury. And now the locals can see these same men flattering and genuflecting in front of a regular-looking, smallish man in a paltry cloak who speaks to them in his brief and simple Spartan way, his laconic way. Agesilaus is becoming the man, at last, that everybody's talking about, that they're coming to to get things done. He settles affairs between quarreling factions and cities. He arranges marriages for his friends. He's spreading the message of Greek independence, of Spartan restraint, of unity, and of loyalty to friends. More and more cities are coming over, and the wealth of Asia, and Phrygia in particular, is pouring into the army's treasury, and it's starting to look like maybe even he underestimated the promise of this great campaign. Maybe those bad omens were all just superstition. And it's at the height of his power that Agesilaus is approached with a message. Pharnabazus himself, satrap of all Phrygia, a great wealthy land, a vast kingdom, in the eyes of a Spartan at least, Pharnabazus wants to meet him in person and discuss their mutual interests. Well, Pharnabazus must be feeling the squeeze indeed. So the two leaders meet at the designated place. Agesilaus arrives before the Persian and he waits for him with his Spartan advisors, reclining under a tree. Pharnabazus approaches, shakes Agesilaus's hand, and sits down with him. No thrones, no couches, just there on the grass, like a Spartan. The Persian speaks first, being the elder. Then he addresses them in perfect Greek. And Xenophon records his words. Agesilaus and all you Lacedaemonians who are present, I became your friend and ally at the time when you were at war with the Athenians. And not only did I make your fleet strong by providing money, but on the land I myself fought on horseback with you and drove your enemies into the sea. And you cannot accuse me, as you accused Tissaphernes, of any double dealing towards you at any time, either in deed or word. Such a friend I proved myself." And now I am brought to such a pass by you that I have not so much as a meal in my own land unless, like the beasts, I pick up the crumbs of what you may leave. And the beautiful dwellings and parks, full of trees and wild animals, which my father left me, in which I took delight. All these parks I see cut down, all these dwellings burned to the ground. If it is I that do not understand either what is righteous or what is just, then you teach me how are these the deeds of men who know how to repay favors? And well, Agesilaus can see that this noble man's words have struck a nerve in the hearts of the Spartan captains present. They're looking at the ground, blushing, embarrassed. You see, Pharnabazus knows who he's dealing with. He's making a pretty fair complaint here. He's pointing out that he's become a guest friend, a xenos of the Spartans, 
He fought the Athenians alongside them a decade earlier. And for the Greeks, to be a xenos is something sacred. It's a relationship between men of different cities and countries who are bound together by a higher principle than the customs of individual states. Zeus, the supreme god, watches over the relationships of xenoi. He punishes people who betray their guest friends without just cause. So, Agesilaus has got to think carefully about his words. And he responds. Here's Xenophon again. I think you know, Pharnabazus, that in the Greek states also, men become guest friends of one another. But these men, when their states come to war, fight together with their fatherlands, even against their former friends. And if it's so chance, sometimes even kill one another. And so we today, being at war with your king, are constrained to regard all that is his as hostile. As for yourself, however, we should prize it above everything to become friends of yours. And then Agesilaus makes Pharnabazus a proposal. Why not remain our guest friends? We don't propose you become our subordinates to change one master, the king, to another, Sparta. No, why not become your own master? We Spartans are poor, but free. You, however, don't need to choose between the two. Keep your great ancestral patrimony. Use your talents and your resources not to increase the king's empire, but your own. Well, Pharnabazus looks at his Spartan counterpart, and he looks at the other Spartans, and they now seem like they've recovered their confidence. And they meet his gaze. Agesilaus is proposing that Pharnabazus revolt from the king. Think about it. If Pharnabazus were to revolt, a Persian of great power, influence, and seriousness, imagine who would follow. And he responds, May I speak frankly before you? Agesilaus nods. Pharnabazus continues, If my king sends another man as general and makes me subordinate to that man, I shall choose to be your friend and ally. But if, on the other hand, he assigns the command to me, so strong it seems is the power of ambition, then I shall war upon you to the best of my ability. Well, Agesilaus grasps his hand, and he says, Ah, would that a man so noble could become our friend. And then he promises to leave Pharnabazus' territory as soon as he can, and the delegations part ways. But before they leave, Pharnabazus' son runs up to Agesilaus, and they have a conversation. And on this occasion, the king of Sparta accepts Pharnabazus' own son as a friend, as a xenos. And later on, when the young man was exiled from his home, Agesilaus helped him start a new life in Greece. Now, however, Agesilaus is at last in position to strike at the heart of the matter in this expedition. He's proved his worthiness far and wide in Asia, Greeks and barbarians alike are flocking to him as a brilliant general, as a representative of Sparta's finest traditions. And on top of that, as an honest man, as a champion of their interests, every bit as ardent as Lysander had been, no less fearsome, and yet more gentle, more kingly. He's built up a great war chest to finance a great bold move too. There's no sense in warring with this or that local satrap. He sees that he can make peace with them now. It's time to turn his attention to a great inland march, an anabasis, as the Greeks called it. The main force of the 10,000 Greek mercenaries who marched with Cyrus had joined with him, and they were now under his command, battle-hardened soldiers, captains, expert in Persian affairs, advising him in his very tent. It was time to set his aim at the king of Persia, at the great king himself, as they called him. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will scatter. But just then, envoys arrive at Agesilaus' camp from Lacedaemon with the worst possible news. A new war has erupted back home. All this time, the great king of Persia has not been idle. He stretched out his long arm from Babylon or Susa or Persepolis or wherever he was at the moment. And through his agents, he secretly dropped a few modest-sized sacks of gold coins into the pockets of the anti-Sparta politicians in a few cities to persuade them to stir up the mob. 10,000 derricks, the famous 
Persian royal coin with the archer figure stamped on one side. That was all it took to get a war declared on Sparta on the home front, something to distract them, to distract all the Greeks from this most serious purpose that they could possibly pursue, this threat that they posed to the Persian king. And who were the cities declaring war? Argos and Corinth were in it. But of course, taking leadership of them all was Thebes. This was infuriating, but the news that came with it was enough to put any Spartan of the time into shocked silence, or any Greek alive, really. The Spartans had sent a force into Boeotia to contain the Theban threat early, but in a Theban surprise attack before the gates of Haliartus, as he covered their allies' retreat, Lysander and his elite Spartan bodyguards got isolated, overwhelmed, and killed. The man who humbled the Athenians, the man who raised up Agesilaus, was dead. And the army he was leading scattered in confusion. So now, Sparta was dangerously unguarded. With the news comes an order from the Supreme Senate of the Lacedaemonians. Agesilaus must return. And as Agesilaus looks around at the thousands of men in the army that he's assembled, he sees Peloponnesians, Arcadians, Mantineans, Eleans, Epidaurians. He sees Phocians, Phocians, Ephesians, Colossians, Milesians. But how many actual full Spartan citizens were there with him? As far as we know, about 30. Does he really have to go back? It's not like the Lacedaemonian authorities are sending them a whole lot of money to support the Asian war. Sparta's not a rich state. Does he even need their help? to do what he's doing. And what if they could cut deeper into the golden veins of Persia's wealth with the force that they have assembled here, with the allies that he's gathering, the contacts that he's making? I mean, couldn't he help Sparta more if they stayed and fought and, you know? But then, what is a king of Sparta who disobeys Sparta's laws? How could Sparta claim moral leadership of united Greeks with that kind of man leading them? Agesilaus later joked, bitterly, that he was turned back from his expedition, not by a great fighting force, but by a mere 10,000 archers, meaning the king's gold coins. And what evil fate was it that made the Greeks turn weapons which threatened barbarians back once again on themselves and brought back war which had already been banished from their land? The allies of the expeditionary force beg him to stay, but he tells them a good leader must himself be led by the laws. And then the core of his army insist on following him back to mainland Greece. And they say, once they defeat their enemies in Greece, well, they can return and finish their business with the Persians. It was a little bit hopeful, but it was a proposal that he could accept. And he's going to need all their help that he can get because the route back to Sparta leads through many enemies and most hostile of them all is the territory of Thebes. The army mobilizes, and they march back into Greece. They take the route Xerxes once took, across the Hellespont from Asia to Europe into northern Greece. They pass through the lands of the Thracians, the Macedonians, and down south into the heartland through the valleys of Thessaly and Phocis. And on their way, some of the locals are willing to let him pass unassailed, and others they have to use force. But at last... They arrive at the borders of Boeotia and the realm of the Thebans. Reports are coming in now that the Thebans have gathered a huge coalition army, 20,000 men strong, to keep Agesilaus from passing through. The king wants to wait for reinforcements. They're still outnumbered. But then one of the ephors arrives from Sparta, and he tells him his orders. Agesilaus is to invade Boeotia immediately. So then, it was time to settle their scores at last. The Lacedaemonian king marches his army through the hot gates at Thermopylae. If only it was for a nobler cause. And the armies meet in central Boeotia, in the neighborhood of a little town called Coronea. They're barely two hours' march away from the spot that Lysander fell at the walls of Haliartus. 
But as the armies are getting ready to fight, another emissary arrives at Agesilaus' tent from back in the east. Disaster at sea. The great Spartan fleet, the one that defeated the Athenians at Aegospotomy, has just been annihilated. And the messenger explains that it happened off the coast of Knidos in the southeastern Aegean, the Battle of Knidos, it would come to be called. The fleet that represented the new age of Spartan Empire were now all captured or half sunk, hauled for scrap into enemy ports. Some were lying at the bottom of the sea, and with these was the unfortunate admiral of the fleet, Agesilaus' own brother-in-law, Paysander. And the victor commanding the opposing navy was none other than Pharnabazus himself, satrap of Phrygia, in the name of the great king of Persia. Pharnabazus had significant help from Athenian sailors too. Athens, who Sparta spared after the war. The Athenians have now joined in on Thebes's anti-Spartan coalition too. Then you know the significance of this sea battle can't have been lost on Agesilaus. Historians would go on to recognize the Battle of Knidos in 394 as a turning point in Greek history, because that Spartan fleet was also the fleet that enforced Spartan supremacy in the Aegean and along the coastline of Asia Minor, really. It was that fleet that was guarding the supply chains of the Asian expedition. And that grand Spartan armada, remember, it was built with Persian gold, built in the shipyards of the great cities on the coast of Asia. The Spartans had no thing like that of their own. They didn't have that kind of money, those kind of shipyards. The fleet was not an easily renewable resource. Agesilaus thinks on this, and then he has his captains and lieutenants go and spread the word that the Spartans have won a great victory at sea at the Battle of Knidos. He knows, as Napoleon put it, that three-quarters of victory is down to morale. And these are not the pasty Persians who they're fighting, but sun-hardened veteran Greek phalanxes, the spears and horses of the lords of Boeotia, the sons of Cadmus. So he made the call that he did. Perhaps the next day would bring a different message. And then he draws the troops up into their battle lines. In Agesilaus' camp on that day, was Xenophon, the philosopher. By then, Xenophon was already a war-scarred young man, but as an old man, looking back after 40 more violent years of Greek history, Xenophon wrote about the Battle of Coronea that there was no other battle like this one in all our times. Not since Agesilaus' youth at Mantinea more than two decades ago have so many Greeks lined up their spears to try them against each other. Arrayed against them are Thebans, Athenians, Argives, Corinthians, Aenianians, Eubians, and both the Locrian tribes. On Agesilaus' side is his coalition of fighters from the eastern cities, the Aeolians, Ionians, Hellespontines. There's a small vanguard of Spartan men-at-arms together with his Peloponnesian forces, as well as some rebel Boeotians from Orchomenus, who recently joined and turned against their former Theban masters. The Theban coalition advances first. The ground is densely overgrown. It's hard for the armies to see each other as they move. But when they get within 600 feet, Agesilaus gives a sign, and his priest sacrifices a goat to Artemis, the huntress. And then he sounds the charge. The lines crash into each other. They begin the shoving and the stabbing. On the right wing, the Spartans grind through the Athenians. They overwhelm them. But the Thebans, the finest fighters on the field besides the Spartans, they're devastating against their rebel neighbors from Orchomenus, and they cut a bloody swath through them on the far left of Agesilaus' line, where the men from Orchomenus were stationed. The Thebans plow through all the way to Agesilaus' baggage train, and they swarm in, they raid the camp, they take gulps from jugs of wine, they slurp from pots and pans, grab shiny cups and fine robes, kick donkeys, throw over tents. But such is the confusion of an ancient battle that one side of the same army can be convinced of victory 
while the other side runs in terror, ravaged by the foe. Because meanwhile, the Spartans are victorious on the rest of the battlefield. And as the dust settles, the Thebans realize what's happened. They have to get out of there fast. They see the rest of their army recovering on the slopes of Mount Helicon. But they themselves, they're isolated. The Spartan army is forming up behind them, closing ranks, cutting off their retreat. They're surrounded. And at this point, Agesilaus has already shattered the morale of Thebes' allies. He's already drawn more than enough blood to declare a victory. And some are saying to him, My lord, the battle is over. We've won. The men are tired. Let us part lines and allow the Thebans through. Then we may chase them and shoot a few men down from the rear as they flee at no risk to ourselves. But here, Agesilaus has in his clutches the very men who have now brought down disaster once again on the heads of the Greeks. The very men who rode up and desecrated his inaugural sacrifice, throwing it off the altar at Aulis. These were the men who were willing to take Persian gold in exchange for Greek blood, who brought baneful war back upon their kindred. And these were the men who killed his friend Lysander. No, Agesilaus would take his price. Or was it the god's price, the price of Artemis? He tightens the net. Close ranks, shield wall. You could see the exhaustion, the incredulity, the horror on the faces of the Theban hoplites through their helmet slits as they realized what they would have to do to get to safety. With a sigh of resignation, they reform their own lines lock their dragon-painted shields, and charge. And then, in Xenophon's words, shield against shield, they shoved, they fought, they killed, and they died. There was no shouting, nor was there silence, but the strange noise that wrath and battle together will produce. In the end, some of the Thebans broke through and reached Mount Helicon, but a great many fell during the retreat, end quote. The next day, the enemies recover their dead under a truce, hundreds killed on either side, though twice as many on the Theban side. His soldiers weave Agesilaus a crown for his victory, but it was a bitter victory, and not because of the wounds that he sustained on nearly every part of his body. He had to be carried off the field after the battle, No, wounds and scars win a man honor at home in Sparta. It was bitter because with that victory died his hopes of uniting the Greeks. That Spartan defeat at sea, the Battle of Knidos, to an allied force of Athenians and Persians, it made it impossible to even consider renewing the Asian expedition, anytime soon at least. For a brief moment, Agesilaus and Lysander dreamed of a different way for Greece. A Greece moving towards unity, towards throwing off the yoke of its powerful Persian suzerain to the east. And who knows, towards Sparta leading it into a new age of freedom and prosperity. But now it was time to face the old reality. The great King Artaxerxes was smiling once again as the Persians took up their preferred position in this region, their ancient role of being absentee investors in an endless war among the mainland Greeks. Because, as Agesilaus and anyone else could see, this battle at Coronea had resolved nothing. This was a new, great war, just beginning, and there was no end in sight. Alas for Greece, Agesilaus is reported to have said at the time, which has by her own hands destroyed enough brave men to conquer all the world's barbarians at once. He marched through the Isthmus at Corinth to return home and report for his new duties. Agesilaus' story is only beginning, but I think there are a few things that we can take away here. First of all, Agesilaus had a handicap. But instead of getting bogged down with insecurity, he found a way to channel it, to convert it into his drive to win, to prove that the gods had spared him, had elevated him, and given these opportunities to him for a reason. So if you have a handicap, maybe it's not physical, maybe it's 
mental or personal, some other way, but maybe it's a disadvantage and it obsesses you and it threatens to trip you up, refine that obsession and make it into your fuel instead. Laugh it off, work harder. Secondly, how often do we take traditional roles to be givens? Say the rivalry of the board and the CEO or between two competitors or the innate mimetic strife between various departments of a corporation or the branches of a government. Agesilaus didn't take his role as king as a given, something that was determined by precedence in all ways. He didn't want to quarrel with the ephors and the gerousia. He wanted to befriend them instead. And by deferring to them, he mastered them, as we'll continue to see. And he tried to break the traditional pattern of animosity between individual Persians and individual Greeks with Pharnabazus. And that example brings out another point. Agesilaus was meticulously trustworthy with his friends. Xenophon remarks that it was because he was so trustworthy that Pharnabazus felt comfortable telling him, hey, if I don't get promoted by the Persian king, I'll join you. That's treasonous. And Agesilaus could have used that against Pharnabazus for some kind of short-term gain. But he saw his reputation as one of his greatest assets. And he didn't see being trustworthy with his friends as in any way hindering him from being tricky and clever and even deceitful against his enemies. Finally, don't we sometimes let bad news demoralize us and trip us up in the fights that we still need to fight? Agesilaus realized this tendency in others, and he also mastered it in himself. He knew before the Battle of Coronea that his hopes were lost. And in these kind of situations, it's hard to maintain focus. It's hard to want to fight for $100 when we were so close to having 10000 But we have to think of doing the best that we can with our actual reality and doing the best for the people who are counting on us, friends, family, leaders, followers, and our future selves. And we can find it within us to fight that much harder. Well, thanks for listening. If you liked this, tell a friend, leave me a review, join our email list, ancientlifecoach.com, or just get out there and get on it. Stay strong, stay ancient. This is Alex Petkus. Until next time.